We don't want your help. I've got a hundred people down here, and they're covered with glass. You're listening to that gets my goat. I thought you were better than that. Glass? Who gives a shit about glass? Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. Actually, hold on one sec. No. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. Here on my left is... Oh, your left. Uh, This is Rish Outfield. (laughs) That's right. You're on the left coast, sir. I'm on the south coast. What would that one be? The bottom coast? Do you guys call yourselves the south coast? Or what what do you call yourselves? You go to the Gulf Coast is what they call it. Oh, okay. Oh, that works. Yep. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another That Gets My Goat. Today we are going to talk a little bit about... Hmm, what will we talk about? The rise and fall from grace. Or... Mm, hubris and what it can do to someone or maybe we'll just talk about glass glass is it half empty or is it half full (laughs) spoilers not the good one (laughs) yes yes i remember there being the old folk tale of the cautionary tale of m night Shyamalan, and i always wondered what that meant what aesop was thinking but you know i feel i feel like in the 21st century, it's all become clear. Yeah. Yeah, you finally understood what he was talking about. It wasn't It wasn't something to do with a night. Neither a night in shining armor, nor just a dark evening. The, the part that comes after a day. But it is a Shyamalan. <laughs> um, tell me before we start, why you went and saw Glass? Glass? Well... I have to admit, I liked Unbroken, Unbreakable, Unbreakable? Yeah, Unbreakable. (laughs) I didn't like it enough to know the title of it. I just liked it (laughs) a little bit. Now, I liked Unbreakable 25, 40 years ago, whenever it was that came out. And I liked Split pretty well. And I went and saw that with you, if I I remember right. I think you dragged me out to one of those uh, discount theaters. I haven't found one of those here in Texas, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, I enjoyed that show, too. And and this is the universal uh, cinematic universe, right? Everybody wants a cinematic universe. It's it's weird, because people have been calling it the uh, East Rail 177 Trilogy. And I don't know where that comes from. That's got to be something that M. Night himself has referred to it as because <laughs> it's so pretentious and I, I assume that's the name of the train that uh that bruce willis's character david dunn survived at the beginning of unbreakable mm-hmm. but uh, yeah i guess we can talk about that later i just i didn't think you were going to go see split I, not split i wasn't going to go see split but you dragged me out to it and i enjoyed it then i thought we should do it that gets my goat should I go see Glass? And you said, hell no. Glass. But I did anyways. See, I don't cause... remember it that way, but that's funny. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a better story than the way I remember it, which was I had gone to see Glass. Glass. And you were going to go see Glass, and you said you were too lazy. <laughs> and then I said, oh, well, don't bother. It wasn't good. And then a couple days later... So did you see Glass? Glass. And you're like, no, you told me not to. <laughs> and I said, but I, yes, but you never do as I say. <laughs> and I was disappointed that you hadn't. And I said, okay, well, let's, we can still do an episode about it without you having seen it. And we'll just talk about M. Night Shyamalan and his fall from grace. And uh, you don't have to have seen Glass. Who gives a shit about Glass? You don't have to, uh, as long as you have seen Lady in the Water or... The Happening, or The Last Airbender, or After Earth. As as long as you had seen those, uh, then then you're all right. And do you remember what you said? Yeah, I said the only one of those I've seen is The Crappening. Oh, you did see The Crappening, okay. (laughs) No, I haven't seen The Happening, but I did see The Crappening. (laughs) Actually, wait, no, that was a story that you wrote. Now I remember. Oh, I read The Crappening. You lived The (laughs) Crappening. But I did not see... 
any of those. So I thought, oh, great. Now I guess that means I need to go see Glass. And so I did. Yeah. Glass. Well, do you regret seeing Glass? Glass. No, it was, it wasn't the worst thing ever. What does it add on Rotten Tomatoes? Like a 30-something or something like that? It is. It's 36 on Rotten Tomatoes. And you and I played a little game the other day while you were stuck in the car where I would say a movie that, you know, was either acclaimed, like Up. I was like, guess what Pixar's Up is on Rotten Tomatoes? And you would guess, and I would tell you you were wrong. And then I'd find a movie that everybody hated, and I'd say, okay, say this. And I thought that that was quite fun. Uh, Sometimes I will do these little games with you where you are a captive audience, (laughs) so you have to play the game. We're going to play a little game. And yeah, this one was fun, but I'm trying to remember what movie it was where it had like a 21 and you're just like, wow, okay, 21 is bad. It's like, I I didn't think that was a good movie, but 21 is, and do you remember what movie that was? I don't, but you kept even giving me ones that were worse. I think one of them had like a six or something like that. And I kept going, oh my gosh. Yeah, you you and I, I, what it was, I think was, I would look, deliberately look up movies that I thought would have really low Rotten Tomato scores, like the Tom Cruise Mummy from 2017. I looked that one up. <laughs> right. And then I think you said like not a teen, another teen movie or something like that. And so, <laughs> so I looked up Disaster Movie and it had <laughs> a one on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh my gosh, a one. I don't know. There was something delightful about discovering that it had a one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that means? That means there's somebody out there that liked it. Oh, no. Okay, that, that's a good point. Although sometimes I wonder, you know, how the, how they score that. Like, because they just take a, a write-up and then they just say, okay, this one's favorable by like, I don't know, they read it. And then you read it and you're like, dude, that wasn't favorable. He actually used the word shit. <laughs> this is a real paper. This is the Chicago Sun-Times. <laughs> that's funny. But you said something at the time, the other day when we were playing this game, where you said, look, people have different opinions and critics have like different views and life experiences and expectations when they go to see a movie. But when a movie has a six or a nine, you know, when it's in single digits, you can trust that that is a (laughs) bad movie. And I feel that way, too. I I, I place a lot of stake in Rotten Tomatoes. If something has a 90, I'll be like, oh, hey, this is probably going to be good. And every once in a while, I'll go see a movie that's critically acclaimed. You know, it's nominated for Best Picture or something. I'll just be like, ah, but that notwithstanding... I feel like Rotten Tomatoes works. Right, yeah. Sometimes you got to be an intellectual to get the uh, intellectual film that's got its score for being cool with intellectuals. But for the most part, they don't mark movies down just because they aren't intellectual. Since we tend to not see intellectual movies, you don't, you don't. I always felt that that was the way it was in the past. Like when I was younger, you know, they, they would be like, oh, I like this movie because it's an intellectual movie. And then they'd be like, oh, Star Wars. That's for kids. That's trash. What was that uh, reviewer that said that? And then uh, Siskel and Eber were like, you're a douche. Yeah, it was it was cool. They both used the word douche. And that was yeah. before everybody used that word. I, I don't remember what his name is. Marshall Latham would remember his name. <laughs> but yeah. Drivel. Somebody needs to go listen to the Delusions of Grandeur podcast and, and let us know. But okay, on this, on, on Glass, Glass, Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 36. I'd probably give it slightly higher than that if I had to give it a score from one to a hundred. Right. But that doesn't mean that I liked the movie. It didn't, it wasn't awful, but it had so much potential. And that's what's frustrated me about it is, yeah, like you said, it's the universal cinematic universe or whatever you were joking. (laughs) It's the rail 36. You know, he'd made two movies that seemed to be separate and then he brought the characters from the two movies together in a sort of a, you know, an Avengers kind of crossover kind of thing. 
he went to this effort to create this shared universe, and then I feel like he squandered it. He chose to say, oh, "Well, this is it, guys," and this, is, and they all die. Spoilers: they all die. And it's, it's like, why? You're supposed to say spoiler before you say they all die. That's what a spoiler alert is. Yeah, I guess I should, but I don't want people to see this movie. Oh, okay. As I said, I don't think it's terrible, but I think he's terrible. Why would you kill all these characters and say, okay, I'm not going to make any more of these? When you, you've been trying to make a sequel to Unbreakable for all these years, and suddenly people say, oh, hey, we'd give you money to do that. There is an audience that's hungry for a sequel to Unbreakable. And M. Night says, yeah, people are always asking me when I'm going to make a sequel to Unbreakable. And I always tell them, no, I'm not going to. It didn't make enough money or I didn't get nominated for an Oscar for it. And so I threw a tantrum. I'm never going to make a sequel. When you finally get to make a sequel and you say, this is it. I'm going to kill them all and I'm not going to make any more. Now, are you happy? No, no, I'm not happy. (laughs) If this were my film, and of course, I, you know, I'm not a filmmaker, but I, I don't think I would squander that goodwill and burn my bridges like this. But I'm not M. Night Shyamalan. He, he, he has a, a tough row to, to hoe because 20 years ago, in 1999, he came out with a little movie called The Sixth Sense that was made for very little money and made a gargantuan amount of money. It was a runaway box office smash. And it put him on the map, on everybody's map. Sixth Sense did get an Oscar nomination. M. Night Shyamalan did get an Oscar nomination for that. And people were saying, in 1999, this guy is the next Steven Spielberg. He followed it up with Unbreakable. And uh, I thought Unbreakable was a really good movie. Really good. And then he followed that up with Signs. And I thought that Signs was a really good movie. I was like, this guy is on his way to being the next Steven Spielberg. He was one of those guys where it's like an M. Night Shyamalan film. And people would say, oh, I'll go to that. Yeah. You didn't need to know who was in it. You didn't need to know what it was about. He had become a marquee name. And there are so few directors that are like that now. I mean, Spielberg is still hanging on. But nobody went to see his movie called The Post. You know, nobody went to see that. I think the the reigning champion today is Christopher Nolan. Chris Nolan just announced he's got a movie coming out 2020. He hasn't announced what it's called, but he announced what the release date is. And everybody said, oh, hey, let's mark this on our calendar. We're all going to go see this. Because he is a marquee name. He has delivered so many times that it's like, yeah, I'll go see whatever Christopher Nolan puts in front of me. He's the master chef at this point. But, you know, there was a time when M. Night Shyamalan was this guy. And the fourth film, now it wasn't the fourth film that he made, but it was the fourth film after he became M. Night Shyamalan. And it was The Village. And The Village was really, really, really flawed. But everybody went and saw it, and it made a gargantuan amount of money. And then the movie after that, the one that I always put as my, uh, oh, the day M. Night Shyamalan died <laughs> was called Lady in the Water. And Lady in the Water was not financed by Disney, which all the others had been, because Disney had had the temerity to give him notes on the script and said, hey, we'd like you to change this. And, and this part doesn't really make sense. And this part, I'm not sure if there's a scene missing, but this, but this part, and he threw it. I I think we called this, in medical terms, a hissy fit. Oh. And he marched away from Disney, and he says, I'm not working with those guys anymore. I'm going to go and do this movie myself. And some other studio, I don't know if it was Universal, I don't know if it was Warner Brothers, they gave him the money to do Lady in the Water the way he wanted, and it came out. And, dude, Lady in the Water was a deal-breaker for me. Anytime I've met somebody who liked Lady in the Water, I think, oh, okay, that's a guy I could not be friends with. You just turn right around and walk away as soon as they admit it without even saying goodbye. 
And it's, it's okay if you actually like Lady in the Water in the same way that people like The Happening, where it's like, no, I watched that with my buddies and we get a huge laugh. See, that is a valid way of watching that movie. But to genuinely <laughs> like it, you have to overlook I, I, the, the hubris of this guy, of M. Night Shyamalan, who made a movie where it's, it's just dumb nonsense. <laughs> but it has this subplot where there is a writer who, he's not famous now, but in the future, his books are going to change America and save the world. That's how great and powerful this writer is going to be. And he cast himself as this writer. It wasn't just like, he, oh, hey, there's your cameo. There's Mr. Hitchcock walking across the screen. He cast himself as this writer. And one of the villains of the movie is a movie critic who talks about how bad movies were are nowadays. And everybody lines up and, and these movies have to have a twist and it's all crap. And so this character is a bad guy and he's savagely killed in the movie. And it's just... I don't know that I could overlook that kind of arrogance from a, a storyteller. Uh, it was just, it, it was eye-opening that this guy had finally believed his own press. And, and I guess that would have been enough if Lady in the Water had been good. But it was not. And then he followed it up with The Happening, which is a laugh riot but in the Plan 9 from Outer Space sort of laugh riot. <laughs> yeah, Shyamalan is not really known for his comedies. Yeah, I just, I, I, and, and after that I was done. It's like, I'm not ever going to see another uh, movie by him. And even The Happening, I went to under duress. I went to it at that dollar theater, and I sort of got dragged to it, not wanting to go see it. But yeah, he, he made these other movies. And I, I, The Last Airbender, we talked about that. That was one of those movies where I said, what is it on Rotten Tomatoes? What is The Last Airbender? And you guessed because your kids hadn't liked it. I think I said like a 30-something and, and it turned out to be a 15 or something like that because you kept giving me things that were 15 See, a 15 in my, I don't know, anything below 30 in my mind is got to be a trauma pictures <laughs> kind of a thing or something, you know. It's like I not, you. Uh, no regular movie gets a 15, not something that was, you know, financed by an actual, you know, respected film company, etc. Et and but, but, but let me interrupt just for a second. I, I did look it up to make sure, and it's not a 15, it's a 5. Oh, <laughs> okay. So there you go. That's the one. Yeah, that I was talking about. Not the one though. It's the five. That's just horrifying. And I guess we could complain about the guy if we wanted to, and 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 you know, about these things. But he had a string of flops and a string of movies that people hated. And I went, uh, oh, it was San Diego Comic-Con one year. I was at the Hall H presentation on Saturday. And I believe this was the day that the guy stabbed the other guy with the pen. <laughs> and they're okay. just like, oh, everything's been derailed. Uh, we're sorry. Everybody, the police say you have to stay in your seats. And we're like, what? The police? And it's like, yeah. Oh, didn't you hear Sting and Andy and Stuart got back together? <laughs> and it's like, for the next hour, we're going to show you trailers to entertain you. And so they showed these trailers, and there, there was a trailer for the movie Devil. Oh, yeah. And it's a horror movie about a bunch of people stuck in an elevator. It's not got a bad premise for a movie. They're all stuck in an elevator, and one of these people happens to be the devil. And at the end of the trailer, it says, M. Night Shyamalan Presents... <laughs> And the audience went nuts, booing and hissing. And I I was really surprised by that. Holy smoke, I had not seen that kind of reaction for a... The only time I had ever... I, I remember people booing was there was a trailer attached to The Phantom Menace for The Beach. 
Oh, right. 20th Century Fox's The Beach. And it's when Leonardo DiCaprio's name came up, there were people in the audience that booed because this was post-Titanic. And every young man in America felt threatened by <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio. We had all been emasculated by Leonardo DiCaprio. We had all been in the arms of a woman that we had genuine feelings for. And she cried out the name of Leonardo DiCaprio. And that's hard, dude. That was not fun. Do you remember when that happened? I cried for a while, dude. So uh, <laughs> I just, I, I guess the point that I was trying to make is there, there was a huge fall from grace with M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, he made a movie called The Visit in 2015. Uh, and, and he was forced to work with uh, Jason Bloom that makes the zero, the, the, the no budget horror movies. Nobody else would make move would give him money to make movies anymore. The Visit had a five million dollar budget, and then the next year after that, also with Jason Bloom with no money at all, he made this movie Split, and it it only cost nine million dollars, but it made two hundred and seventy eight million dollars worldwide, which if a movie costs nine, that is a huge success. Yeah, But not only that, it got good reviews. It got good word of mouth and people started talking about it. What is the Rotten Tomatoes score on Split, if you had to guess? Uh, 60? You know, that's a pretty good guess. It's actually 76. Oh, okay. I can I can see that. I, I, I didn't want to over, you know, You didn't want to overshoot the mark, <laughs> yeah. Split was cheap. And it was stylized, but it worked. And I dragged you to that because I had heard about the ending of that movie. We went and saw it, and uh, I didn't particularly like it, but most people did. And it was successful enough that, the, that Universal gave Shyamalan mo money to make a follow-up, to make Glass. Glass. And that just came out, and you and I went and saw it. And I just, I, I feel like... He earned back some goodwill from the audience, and then he made this. <laughs> and I, I feel like I've been tricked. I've been cheated. I, I don't know. I, I guess I should have realized when the movie began, and it starred James McAvoy <laughs> rather than Bruce Willis. And then the movie is called Glass. Glass. <laughs> and Mr. Glass, Samuel L. Jackson... He's he, most of the movie. Even he's not even in. Yeah, that's true. The, the the first like fifteen minutes of this movie, I was just like, "This is great." I don't know what people are talking about. Right. The fact that it had uh, Spencer Treat Clark as his son again, and he's clearly the same kid that was his son in the first one. I was just like, "Oh, cool!" I didn't know they were going to do that. That's great. And the, and the, even though 20 years have passed, they're still working together. He's still out there trying to be a hero. And it's just like, oh, that's so cool. The idea of that. And they show, you know, they remind you what his ability was, where he could touch somebody and see what, ah, what would you say? What sins that they yeah, have. What their sins are. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that, that's a really good way of, of putting it. And, and so he has decided to go after this, this thing called the Horde, which is James McAvoy's character. See, I thought he was called the Beast, but I guess he was called the Horde. The Beast is a personality of the Horde. Right. He's, he's a guy with 23 personalities, and each one has like a physiological change on his body, right? Didn't they say that one of them was a uh, diabetic. And, yeah, the and, diabetic one would actually have issues with insulin, whereas when he wasn't the diabetic one, it, that wasn't the case. So yeah, I, I don't know about how much the rest of it mattered. Like when he became the nine-year-old, I don't, you know. <laughs> All of a sudden puberty reversed on him or something. It wasn't, it wasn't that intense, I don't think. Yeah, so, so so anyhow, they decide to get he to go after the beast, or David Dunn does after the horde. Sorry, and and he has 
caught, I want to say, four high school cheerleaders and he's got them tied up. Yeah. And he's taunting them that the beast is going to come and he's going to eat you. And so there are actual stakes and there's a ticking clock. There's something that only David can fix. He is able to uh, be guided to evil or criminals or rights that need to be wrongs that need to be righted. <laughs> rights that need to be wronged. Now that's me. <laughs> and I, That's your power. I just, I really dug the way that the movie started and showing us what was going on. And immediately he finds uh, the horde. Uh, Kevin Wendell Crumb is his name, I remember. Because in the first one, if you say his name, it's like reverse Candyman. If you say his name, he loses his power. <laughs> uh, but yeah, almost immediately he finds where this guy is and he goes and he rescues these four girls and they have a big fight. The Beast versus David Dunn. Then they are captured by the police. And the rest of the movie takes place in a sanitarium, a mental institution, right? Uh -huh. That happens to be the mental institution where Mr. Glass, Glass. where Elijah Price... Samuel L. Jackson's character from the first movie has been kept all these years. And me describing this to you redundantly, because you saw the movie yesterday, <laughs> makes me think, I, dang, this is a good movie. I think you're describing this to the listeners. I'm describing it to the listeners, because I don't want you to have to go see it. But That's right. But it, I, I feel like this is the premise of a really, really solid film. Yeah, it, it seems like it could be. And it even starts out as a pretty good movie. You know, that first bit, I didn't hate. I didn't even feel indifferent about it. I thought, yeah, this is pretty good so far. It took a while for it to start, for you to start going, huh. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. It, it, it focuses a lot on this doctor that Sarah Paulson played. And she's a psychologist and, and she has a very narrow focus or specialty. What would you say is her area of expertise? <laughs> she says several times that she treats people with the disease where they think that they're superheroes. Which apparently that's just happening all the time now. <laughs> she's got three people that she's got to deal with. So, you know. Here's a quick question for you. The flashy light thing. Was that a thing in Split? If the light flashed, he would switch personalities? I think that his psychologist had discovered this toward the end of the movie. That a flashing light would, would trigger a change. So the movie Split was... It was primarily about the three girls that Kevin Wendell Crumb had kidnapped... But it kept cutting to this psychologist that was his, his shrink who was right. writing papers and she, she was heavy into his delusion or his, um, help me out here, the, the mental issue. Dissociative identity disorder? Yeah. She seemed to have a very narrow focus in her, her, her practice as well. Anyhow, I, I feel like at the end of that movie she discovers that, that, you know, a bright light can make somebody else take over. Like, but I don't know. I mean, they established that early on, and it, it's that Sarah Paulson's character knows that David Dunn's weakness is water. She's got this giant tank hooked up to the cell where she's got him in, and this tank will flood with water the cell if he tries to escape. If he tries to use his invincibility power, tries to pick up a table and throw it. But it, it, she knew, again, spoilers, right? She knew that they really had powers, right? Oh, yeah. So, because if you... Why would you do the stuff that she did otherwise? I mean, why would... Well, I mean, I guess with the Horde, you just want him to switch, but why would you do the stuff with, with David giving him water if, if you're... If you don't believe he actually has superhuman strength, yeah. And then, of course, Mr. Glass, Glass, his weakness is his body. 
you know, he's super, super smart, but he's in a wheelchair and his bones break so easily that uh, there were a couple of times like when he clapped his hands and I was like, oh, don't do that. Because I, I just, I worried. We saw in that first movie just how, I don't want to say helpless, what's the word? Vulnerable Elijah was. But yeah, in this movie, he's being drugged the whole time. Yeah, he's coked to the gills. He is, because they know that he's smart, I guess, and that he could escape if they... Yeah, I, I think they mentioned that he did stuff before that caused problems, and so now they have to keep him drugged all the time. But anyhow, the vast majority of the film, like I said, takes place in this sanitarium, and it's... Most of the movie is Sarah Paulson trying to convince those two characters, because Mr. Glass is in a coma, basically, that they are wrong, uh, that they're not superhuman, that they're not special. And every once in a while it will cut to David Dunn's son, who's out there and is upset that his dad has been institutionalized, but... I mean, his dad is a criminal. He is a vigilante, right? And they will cut to Anya Taylor-Joy. Is that her name? Yeah, the, I think so. The The actress. Do you have it in front of you? The girl that escaped from the Beast at the end yes. of the first movie. And you, it's been two years since you saw it, right? Uh-huh. He let her go when he saw that she had scars all over her arms and her stomach yeah, because she'd been abused by her uncle. Right. And so it let her go, or he let her go, the Beast did. And now she's, I guess, a, a normal high school student, or trying to be a normal high school student, but she's drawn to uh, the Horde. Gosh, it's so hard. I'm sorry. I, I just need the list in front of me. <laughs> but, I mean, that, that was something really strange. I don't believe Bruce Willis's son ever gets to visit and talk to him. And he's like, Dad, I'm going to get you out of here. Or, Dad, just hold your breath and then ba break through the wall when they throw the water on you. But she is allowed to go and talk to uh, the Horde. And I just, to me, that's so strange that somebody who had been kidnapped and, you know, the victim of this guy would be allowed to go talk to him. It just doesn't seem likely. Yeah, I'd talk to it, like go inside his room with him so that she can touch him and he could touch her, etc. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing like to go to one of those little things where you have to pick up the phone and then the other guy picks up the phone on the other side and you talk through the plexiglass or whatever. But And on top of that... You also have Mr. Glass's mom. Oh, yeah. Who's somehow still hanging around. How old is Samuel L. Jackson? Real life, Sam Jackson is about 70. Yeah. How, like, his mom is still tooling around and is still this sprightly and able to just keep doing stuff. She's got to be in her 90s. Yeah, but the old age makeup was so terrible that we let it go. We're like, nah, she's, she's clearly pretty spry. She's, she's a younger woman there. She looks like his wife instead of his mom. They basically look like they're the same age. I feel like Elijah uh, was supposed to be a lot younger than Sam Jackson. But I, I, I feel like Sam Jackson, unless he's playing Nick Fury, is supposed to be a lot younger than the characters that he plays. Okay. Sorry, sorry. The characters that he plays are supposed to be a lot younger than him. But they didn't make him look younger. I mean, he had like gray all through his hair and... Oh, okay. You know who they made look old? Bruce Willis. <laughs> but I didn't care. It's just like every moment Bruce Willis was on the screen, I was just like, oh, hey, this is cool. And it, it's weird because I know that he makes a lot of movies and not all of them are good, but he's still a movie star. One of those guys where it's just like, hey, I can't stop looking at Bruce Willis. And whatever he his character cares about, I care about too. He's a compelling guy. Samuel L. Jackson is a really compelling actor, but not as drugged Elijah Price. Most of the time, he was, like you said, drugged to the gills, but you could sort of see like the real Elijah peeking out or whatever. And you're just like, oh. But we didn't get the cool speeches with him like we got in... 
Unbreakable, where he was a weird guy, but he was a mentor character. He was a Mr. Miyagi, Yoda kind of guy with David, where he was trying to tell him about how comic books are, you know, are fantasy, but there's a hint of truth in it, and you, you know, are something great. I missed that with the character, but I guess I understand that you're not going to have those relation that relationship anymore. The first movie ends with David Dunn realizing that Elijah was at fault for this train crash and the plane crash and the fire in the building that were mentioned earlier in the movie, trying to find somebody who could survive, you know, who is unbreakable. And I guess that ends their friendship. But I just, I, I was a shame that we didn't get to see that mastermind character much in this movie. But we don't see much of Elijah in the movie at all. And I, I have to say that, that was by design, right? Yeah, I mean, he wrote the script that way, so... I don't know what the point of it is. It, it, when he does come around and start rambling about stuff like that, it doesn't seem to help this time around. They keep going to like comic books all through this movie. Oh. They show like Anya Taylor Joy looking at comic books and bugging her eyes out, and they show uh, like <laughs> Spencer Treat Clark going to the comic book store and looking at comic books. And Sarah Paulson goes to the comic book store too. And she looks... It doesn't go anywhere. And every line is so awful. Like, every guy... You know, there's the two guys who are arguing... What are they saying? I can't remember what they're saying. But there's, like, two guys standing over talking to each other. They're not conversations that people actually have. If You know, it's like, this guy's... He's going to be great because of... And then there's the other guy who's like, yeah, the first comic book and then... Boom, here comes Superman, Action Comics number, you know, the comic book shop owner. Each one of them, their lines are just eye-rollingly bad, where you're just like, oh. Even the stupid dude that M. Night Shyamalan plays himself at the start of the movie is the same way. Like, conversa- nothing flowed in the movie at all all the conversations were so stilted and strange they didn't go together they jumped around and or they were just there it's like hi i am mr exposition how are you (laughs) they they don't talk like people actually talk but you mentioned when mr glass starts to come out of it and you know regain his mind and all that stuff and his plan starts to we come together. You yeah, know, he, yeah. I, I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they they're they're going to do this thing where they, I don't know, fry his ganglia or something like that, and he turns the tables on them, and it actually fries the ganglia of everybody else in the room, but he's protected in the booth. Okay, that didn't happen, but. He turns the tables, he tricks them. But he does take off his his S off of his chest and throw it at the other guy, and it crinkles him up inside of, like, the the plastic wrap. It's like he's been shrink-wrapped. Yeah, that did happen. But I remember when that happened, when we see the that he switched out the lens, suddenly my interest started to ratchet up again. Because it felt like, okay, we're building towards something now. Now we get to find out why this movie is called Glass. This is cool. And basically his plan is that David and the Horde are going to have a battle royale at the unveiling of the biggest building in the city, in Philadelphia, in front of a zillion witnesses. And that the world will know that superhumans exist. And I don't know about you, but I was just like, wow, okay, I'm looking forward to it. That's going to be a cool fight. They kept talking about it. So I, I guess my expectations started building that this was going to be something <laughs> neat we're going to see happen. But the three of them escape from the institution. The Horde, Mr. Glass, and Glass. they gave a name to David Dunn's persona. The Overseer. Really? Yes. The Overseer? The Overseer. Huh. Okay. I, I guess that works for his power, but... It was better than Mr. Tiptoe. Yeah. Yeah, it was. 
the three of them escape and they fight on the, the grounds of the mental institution. And Sarah Paulson is there. Anya Taylor-Joy is there. Spencer Treat Clark is there. Mrs. Glass is there. <laughs> They're all there. And then like this, all these like assassins show up. All these dudes that are like dressed in SWAT outfits, but they show that they have shamrock tattoos on their wrists. And the first time that they showed this shamrock tattoo, the, the camera makes sure that you see it because dang, this is important. And I thought, oh, I, I've missed a movie. There's another movie. I didn't see The Visit. I'll bet this is from The Visit or I didn't see After Earth and this, because it was so heavy handed that I was just like, oh no, I am dumb because I don't realize what this is saying. But no, it, it wasn't a reference to something else. It turns out that Sarah Paulson's character is part of a secret society. And they all have these shamrocks on their wrists. And their purpose is to keep superhumans a secret, right? And so these SWAT <laughs> guys <laughs> kill David Dunn. The Beast kills Mr. Glass. Glass. And they kill the Beast. Right? Yeah. Now, the question that you got to wonder is, if this was an option, why did they spend all this time trying to convince them that they're not superheroes in the insane asylum? Why didn't they just kill them in the first place when they caught them? I guess there's probably a line earlier where Sarah Paulson says, I only have three days. Yeah. Yeah to convince them that they are crazy and then something's going to happen. Then somebody else is going to step in. And, and I guess that that was a hint that her organization was going to come in and kill them. Or once they escaped, then the organization made a, an executive decision and said, okay, now we're going to kill them. I don't know, but I don't feel like M. Night knew either. <laughs> exactly. I've been watching, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but there's this uh, YouTube series, and I want to say the, the channel is Screen Rant, but there's this guy who does pitch meetings. He plays both characters, and the only difference is one character has glasses and the other one doesn't, and they're wearing different clothes. Basically, it's Superman and Clark Kent, I guess. But the writer guy has glasses on, and then the producer guy has, does not. And the writer guy pitches movies to the producer guy, and the producer guy will ask questions, and the writer guy often has absolutely no idea or he'll say, why didn't they just do this? And he says, because then there wouldn't be a movie. Yeah, that's what it feels like a lot with a lot of this movie. It's like, why didn't they just do this? Because then there wouldn't be a movie. Why didn't they just shoot him in the first place when they captured him? I mean, they could have, right? Or they captured him. Why didn't they just drown David <laughs> Dunn the minute they got a hold of him instead of wait for there to be a deep puddle? <laughs> <laughs> well... That You know, that's a question. And sometimes with movies that really rely on twists, it ruins the movie if somebody asks those questions. But in this case, my question is just why, why did he make the movie like this? So after the three are dead, there are still three remaining secondary characters. Like a, a sidekick to each of our superhumans. And those three discover a way to let the world know that these three characters were extraordinary. And so they release the footage on the internet and they all go to the train station and everybody at the train station is watching this stuff on their phone. And I think that's it. I think that's the end of the movie. Yeah, that's the end. They're all looking at their phones just like they did. Just like they do in real life. Before all that video came out. Yeah. <laughs> but I was flummoxed at the end of the movie. Because it, it seemed like there was the potential for something pretty dang good in this film. And it seemed like maybe we were promised something in a sequel to Unbreakable or a sequel to split that this movie was not and i i couldn't help but feel like that was intentional that 
M. Night knew what people wanted, and he said, I don't care. I'm M. Night Shyamalan, and you're going to get this. And I just, I don't know why, and it bothers me, and it, it makes me feel dumb. It's There's that old saying of, fool me once, shame on you. And I, I feel like I've been fooled, and, and the shame is on myself. Why did I trust him? Why did I say, okay, I will go see another M. Night Shyamalan movie? I can only guess that it's because Split was enough to woo you back. Like I said, you know, you asked me, why did you go see this movie? A, I liked Unbreakable. Like you liked Unbreakable. B, Split was good. You know, it wasn't terrible. It had its moments. It was interesting. And, oh, now it's linked to this other movie. Oh, now that's cool. That that gives you something that you're interested in. And here comes that thing that you're interested in. And then, whoosh, you pull the rug out from under them and surprise, it's not what you're interested in after all. And we're going to make sure that there's nothing left for you to deal with later. We're just going to kill everybody. The end. Also, we can have a, a, a cheesy twist at the end where, oh yeah, there's this group that keeps meeting at a restaurant. I guess they just like flash mob the restaurant where... All the people in the group go to the restaurant and the only people in the restaurant are the people in this group. Because this happens like twice, right? You know, he sees the flashback of it happening and then it happens again when she like reports on how it went. Right. And I also, I don't get it at all. Like, why would there be a secret organization a secret, a terrorist organization bent on world domination. No, they're not bent on world domination. They're just bent on, let's make sure nobody hears about superheroes. Why? Why is that worth creating some overarching secret organization, Cobra and Destro? What is the point of that? Is it really worth it? Or wouldn't they want to instead, I don't know, make a secret organization that brainwashes these superheroes so that they serve them and work for them or, you know, something that makes sense. Instead of just, we're just trying to hide the truth just because. Because that's what secret people do. It leaves you wondering. And on top of that, you know, your, your big twist in the end is Glass got the better of her. Glass. Because he got the video out and they were able to release it out into the internet and now everybody sees it. But... Why was there video at all? The chick installed all those extra cameras herself. She's the one that wants to keep it a secret, but she recorded all the video. Why would anyone do that if their goal was to keep it secret? Wouldn't she instead have all those repairmen guys go up and, like, ruin the cameras so none of them worked instead? Uh, I hadn't thought of that, but I, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> I just, I feel like her plan didn't work. Her character didn't work. It was one of those... Her lisp she didn't work? Was, say again? Did you notice her lisp? Well, yeah, but that's Sarah Paulson. I guess it's the story that he wanted to tell, and he had creative freedom in telling it. And in a way, I guess that's admirable that somebody stuck to their guns and that he continues to make these, these movies the way that he wants to make them. But it wasn't the movie that I wanted to see. And I wanted to see, what I guess, what the premise of the movie was at the very beginning, where Bruce Willis is out there fixing wrongs making wrongs right then you know he finds he runs up against somebody that he's not going to be able to stop and he's like can he do it or whatever the first 15 minutes of the movie should have been the movie right and i i feel bad that we did that we didn't get that movie and then even if this movie if if m night had wanted to make a story about meta and you know people that think that they're superheroes or man, there's too many superhero movies out there, or whatever statement he's trying to make, why kill them all so that you burn your bridges and you can't make 
more stories about David Dunn. And I, I don't know. I, I'm disappointed, like I said, with him, but with myself for going to see it. <laughs> for falling for it again. Yeah, well, I don't know that this is a very entertaining episode. But I, in preparation for seeing Glass, I, I rewatched Unbreakable and saw Split again. And Ooh, wow, that's dedication. Yeah, you you could say that I. Well, apparently you, you can't say that. So one thing that I really liked about this movie about Glass, Glass. was that it flashed back to the first movie. But they used deleted scenes from the first movie instead of actual scenes from Unbreakable. <laughs> and I, I don't know that I've ever seen a movie do that before. I mean, the fact that they still have the same kid playing his son as an adult, I thought that was great. That was probably the coolest thing about the whole movie. That it's a sequel to a 20-year-old movie and now the kid is an adult. And... He's an actor that you've seen before, you know. He's not just some rando that disappeared like Soleil Moonfry or something like that. He's somebody that, you know, you see his face and you go, oh, yeah, that, that was the guy that was in the, um, the uh, something. I know I've seen him. Then they even give you shots of him when he's a kid so you can realize that this is, yeah, that's because there's no not recognizing that face. You know, he's got the eyes that are just kind of weird so that they, they're totally, you know, you don't look at it and go, oh, I know that could be anybody. It's not like that kid then that was in Jerry Maguire and now he's like a bodybuilder or something like that. He basically looks exactly the same just 20 years later. And that was cool. I thought that was really neat. It makes me think of that boyhood movie where they shot, you know, two weeks every year for like 12 or 14 years or whatever in a row and so you actually saw in the movie the kid actually grow up that was neat and so was this but that's it's pretty much the neatest that it got unfortunately yeah i i agree on that too and like i said just the the start of the movie gave us a a movie that i wanted to see and how would it be if your dad, who is now an old man, is stronger than you and uh, is a hero and you're just a regular person. That was an interesting question. It's not ever addressed, but like I I'm assuming that David and Audrey had stayed together until she died of cancer. How does it feel when you have all these tremendous abilities, but you can't save the woman that you love? That was a question that I don't think got answered either. It's just like, that is fascinating. That's something, you know, it's like we see Superman movies, but it's always a new Superman. You've never said, okay, well, now Christopher Reeve is 50 years old. And let's deal with that. Because, you know, these characters, these heroes never age. But in, in a movie like this, it would have been really interesting to say, okay, what kind of toll is taken living this life? Or, or having this knowledge about people. Is it a gift or is it a curse? And the fear of uh, the, the, the having the weakness of water, what does that do to you? Give me 10 different examples in which hydrophobia, which I know is rabies, but you know what I'm saying, <laughs> would come into play, which would be an interesting scene for, again, a movie about David and his son trying to track down the beast. The movie that we didn't see. I don't know. I, I, maybe the fault isn't with M. Night Shyamalan. Maybe the fault is with me that I wanted to see a movie and I didn't get it, and now I'm, I'm complaining about it. But it's just talking about these things to you. I go, oh, geez, I would have seen that movie. That would have been really cool. Yeah, it's just the potential that was wasted. You know, the, the the 20 years that passed as Unbreakable and Split gathered that potential energy and all, all that potential energy was up there and it could have been used for a really great purpose, but instead this is what we got, <laughs> which is just kind of a bummer, you know? And we've talked about that before, where you go and you watch a trailer and you think, oh man, 
that looks good. I want to see that. And then you go to the movie and you're like, oh, man, that could have been good. How did they blow it so badly? So much potential just wasted. Oh, it's unbelievable. So it's, it's just kind of a bummer when that happens. It happens frequently enough. And maybe it is just the hubris that, that you're talking about, you know, that you were talking about before, where he refuses to take notes and fix things. And so then somebody's going to watch it and go, why, why did this happen? Why did that happen? You know, you should have sat down with somebody or many somebodies and gone through pitched them the idea and let them poke holes in it so you can be like oh yeah i better fix that it takes learning sometimes it's hard i guess and uh maybe if you hit such great heights right out of the gate like uh Yamalan did with the sixth sense maybe you think no I, I'm, I'm there man i don't need you guys i'm the greatest writer of the world and my writing will save the universe yeah, it's too bad. I think a lot of people would kill to have the opportunities that he's had. And he's mostly squandered them. And I would be willing to say that he's kind of at the at the end. Maybe he doesn't need to make any more movies. I mean, I, he's probably still got money left over from making The Sixth Sense. Much less the money that he also must have from making Split. So... You know, maybe he's fine. He can just go, like, live in the south of France for the rest of his life and just flip everybody off and say, there you go. I gave you your sequel to Unbreakable. Now you guys can leave me alone. Don't bug me like you did with George Lucas. Yeah, the the George Lucas thing is a whole nother subject, but it's related. George Lucas had created something that was so successful that he didn't have to answer to anybody that he didn't have to have notes or bring other people into the room and collaborate with them and, and, and say, you know, I'm going to have to do another draft on this. Where, where is it weak? What can I focus on? And I feel like it was super damning for those three movies that he made that, you know, it still bothers me. It still bothers me that those movies failed the way that they did. I, I should let it go. Because there's a whole generation of people that grew up after that say, Those movies are fine. You're the one that's wrong. You're the person that's broken. Yeah, anybody who thinks the prequels are bad needs to grow up. The fucking bastard. And I, I guess that's the subject for another day. But, you know, what happens when you surround yourself with only yes men and you stop listening to criticism? It's the cautionary tale of M. Night Shyamalan and I feel like you and I should get together again and talk about that and talk about the power of criticism, the power of notes, the power of somebody saying, you know, I, I feel like you used this word a little bit too much. You know, and that's different than somebody saying, oh, you're a giant a-hole and I wish you were dead. But somebody that's genuinely trying to help the project or help you, I don't know, it makes me think of myself. It makes me wonder if maybe my David Dunn water-like fear of criticism is damning to me. Is it prevents me from being a better writer. But as I said, that's a subject for another day when it's not past one o'clock for you. Yeah, I think we'll have to uh, hold that off to the next episode because we have uh, been going for already an hour. I think our listeners will uh, want to strangle... If uh, we try and make them stay for two, because it'll probably take us another hour to get through that. But, you know, there's always next episode. Yeah. Well, thank you, Big, for uh, going to see that movie so that we could do this episode. I still feel like the episode would not have changed at all if you hadn't gone to see the movie. (laughs) Except for you would be saying, okay, but wait, if they all wanted to kill them, then why? You would be asking me these questions like, there was something wrong with my telling of the, of glass to you. And I'd be like, no, I, I didn't leave anything out. Yeah, well, okay, but you're telling it wrong because it sounds like... Well, you are welcome. It was, uh, it was, I mean, it wasn't the worst thing ever. It was, what was it, a 36? So, you know, I mean, it wasn't a five. 
So, you know, it was my pleasure. We'll do this again. Maybe next episode we'll watch another movie and talk about it. Oh, hell no, Big Ankovich. Hopefully it'll be a it'll be a 70 or an 80 or a 100. All right. Thank you. And thank you for listening, folks. That's right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. I'm Big Ankovich. And I'm Rish Outfield. It was the kids, Biggie. They called me Mr. Glass. Glass? Finish it. Finish it. <laughs> I don't... Glass? <laughs> Who gives a shit about glass? <laughs> Good night. Please, sir, that gets my goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. But you're free to steal it. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.